my soul. That's a great thought right there. It's one that we need to remember often. Uh, It's easy to get caught up in the busyness of this world, or maybe even get caught up in some turmoil or troubles that we're dealing with. But man, what a good reminder to just stop and take the time to praise the Lord for saving our soul. Um, No matter how rough it gets, uh, one thing we can be sure of, I'm thankful for, we are bound for an eternity of paradise with Him. And uh, we just want to make sure that we remember that as we go about our life. All right, we are back in the book of Romans chapter 12. Now this morning, we covered a whole six words. Six words. Distributing to the necessity of saints. Hate to tell you this, we're going to cover even fewer words this evening. We got three. Got three whole words. Given to hospitality. Given to hospitality. And again, we are talking about being a living sacrifice for the Lord. Chapter 12 opens with that idea that that is our reasonable service. It then goes on and it talks about how that the Lord has given the gifts that we have And we need to use those gifts for His glory. We need to focus on those things that He has called us to do. Don't be worried about so-and-so's gift. You worry about the gift God has given you, and you use that gift for Him. Don't be too lifted up about your own conceit and your own abilities. Don't look down on the things that God has called others to do, but you focus on what He has called you to do. And then at the end of that message, it gets into this list of Christian characteristic traits. And again, we've talked about this already. Our pattern is the Lord Jesus Christ. There is nobody that showed more sincere love and genuine love and love without hypocrisy than he showed. There is nobody that showed the right disdain for evil that he showed. There's nobody that clung to the things that are good like he did. There was no one that showed affectionate love, brotherly love, more than he did. Diligent in his service to God. Diligent in the things that he had been given to do. Fervent in the, ser- in the Spirit, serving the Lord. Uh, rejoicing in hope. Patient in tribulation. Constant or continuing instant in prayer, and then distributing to the needs of the saints, right? Those are the lists that we've been through so far. And as I've mentioned a few times, this is not meant to be a a list of items that you get to go pick and choose. Well, I know I need to have three of them, so I'm going to pick these three and I'm going to leave the others. Or maybe I'm going to go pick and choose which one I want to use for the situation at hand. This is the list of things When the world looks at us, they should see these things, right? They should see these things. And these things, interestingly enough, some of them are more directed at us toward each other, but not all of these. This other one that we just talked about, distributing to the necessity of saints, was very focused on our willingness to share and help provide for brothers and sisters in Christ. That's very pointed. It's about the Lord's believers being a help to each other. It didn't mention saints specifically when it talked about being having love without dissimulation. It didn't talk about that when it talked about not being slothful in business or continuing instant in prayer. These are things that should be reflected in our life. They're hard. They don't come easy. Some of them, you may find, actually come fairly natural to you. Some people are just naturally giving people. Some people are naturally good at hospitality. But listen, 
just because these, some of these may not come natural to you doesn't mean that you're not supposed to be striving to do these. We tend to like to pick the things that we're just naturally good at. And let's focus on that. This is a list of things that we need to be working on. And interestingly enough, I think this next one we're going to cover, the way this word means is a good example of why I say that these are things that we sometimes have to pursue. These are things we have to strive for. These are things we have to work at. So as we look at these words, given to hospitality, given to hospitality, what does given to mean? So it says given to hospitality. Well, in, in the English version, given to is a phrase that ties back to one Greek word. Okay? And that word means to pursue. Now, we often think about given to, and there's a reason, and I'll explain it in a little bit. We often think about given to, when we read given to hospitality, we think prone to hospitality or fond of hospitality. And there is a reason, I think, for that. Uh, in, and we'll get into these verses later, but in Titus and Timothy, it does use that same phrase, given to hospitality, but the given to in those verses is a different word than this word here. And that one uh, actually does mean fond of hospitality or prone to hospitality. Here, it actually means pursuit or to pursue. It is a different word. Now, they are related, and I'll get into that in a little bit. I'm not saying that they're different and that uh, because it's a different word that, well, what we're said to pastors about hospitality and what we're saying to everybody in hospitality is different. They're very much related. They both tie back to hospitality. But I want you to understand that here, this word given to means pursue. It is very much an action word. It's very much uh, a, a, a word dealing with action. Sometimes some of us are good at hospitality, prone to it, naturally prone to hospitality. For some of us that are that way, this idea of being given to hospitality may not seem like a big stretch. It's not a big effort. We're just naturally good at that. That's the way we think of prone to or good at hospitality. This word is not describing that you are good at it. This word is describing that you are in pursuit of it. Matter of fact, I want you to understand how much of an action word this is. So given to hospitality, given to meaning, the Greek word behind it meaning to pursue. Listen to this. Often the word that is here translated given to, when in its negative context, a lot of words have a positive and a negative context, and it means different depending on which way you use it, okay? In its negative context, this word is almost always translated persecute. This is the same word that when in a negative context is translated persecute. Persecute's a pretty intense word, isn't it? We usually think of what happened to Paul, thrown in jail or beaten and left for dead. Persecuted. It doesn't mean that here, but it does give you the idea of the intensity of the word. Matter of fact, the very next verse says, Bless them which persecute you, 
bless and curse not. That is the same Greek word in those two verses. Given to hospitality and bless them which persecute you. To pursue after is the concept. Philippians chapter 3, verse 14. Yeah, verse 14. Listen, here Paul is talking to the Philippians and he says, if we back up a verse 13, Brethren, I count not myself to be apprehended, but the thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the holy, of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Listen, when he says in verse 14, I press toward the mark. That's that same concept as given to. Pressing toward the mark. Paul is describing his, how deep and passionate he is about this. You begin to understand, again, I want you to, as we go through this, I just want you to understand the intensity of the word given to. Given to. Um, when, like I mentioned, persecute, when, when it's used in that negative context, means to run or flee, to put to flight, to drive away. In the, in the positive context, it's the opposite. Instead of to flee, or to pers it's to pursue after. To press toward that mark. The phrase, I press, is that same word. Matter of fact, if you turn over to 1 Corinthians, and we got a lot of turning we're doing in this study here, but 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Now this is right after the love chapter, right? We're in the end of chapter 13. It says, and now abideth faith, hope, Charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. And then you roll over to chapter 14, verse 1. Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts. That word follow after is the same word. To pursue after this. It, it's actually oftentimes translated follow after. And you get the idea that it's not simply something, it's not, a, it's not a characteristic trait you already have. It's something you are supposed to strive to be. You have to work at it. 1 Peter uh, chapter 3, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 11. We'll back up a verse, let's start in verse 10. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that speak uh, and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. When it says let him seek peace and ensue it, that is the same word that is used and translated in Romans as given to hospitality. Ensue, you look that word up, it means to pursue after. Listen, I think what I'm trying to say, for those of you that are good at hospitality naturally, this is an easy thing. For those of us that struggle with hospitality, be encouraged because the word actually means this is what you're supposed to pursue after. It may not come easy. It may not even come naturally to you. But as a born-again believer of the Lord Jesus Christ, trying to pattern yourself after Him, one of the things you should be trying to do is to be hospitable to those around you. It just it was so interesting to me, and I know I'm spending a lot of time on this. I had never seen the fact 
that this word meant to pursue after. Because honestly, every time I had read it before, I read it as, we, well, we should be good at hospitality. <laughs> we should be, because we're laboring and toiling and trying to do this. You say, this is obviously being preached by somebody that struggles sometimes with hospitality. I'm just telling you what the word means. It means pursuit of, right? Negative context, persecute. Positive context, pursue. Think it's important? Pursue after hospitality. All right, let's keep going. So it is an intense word, meaning to pursue after something, not just to be prone to something. What about this word hospitality? Uh, in, in today's world, the word hospitality is almost the only time really that we hear the word hospitality anymore is when it talks about the hospitality industry, which is usually talking about uh, hotel and, and, and food and things like that, right? Well, I guess to some degree that uh, I can see where the connection might be, but uh, this is a little bit more close to home. This is a little bit more about us being willing to, uh, to welcome people, to be hospitable, to have them in to our homes, to our church, and to be able to care for their needs, okay? So let's go back here to the book of Romans. We'll be here for just a minute. Romans chapter 12 again. Given to hospitality. Given to hospitality. Strong's, uh, Strong's doesn't help a whole lot in this case when you're looking for a definition. Strong's says uh, hospitableness. If you look up Strong's and what does it say about given to hospitality, it says to be hospitable. Okay, thanks for that. If you look it up in Webster's, you'll see the word hospitable means the act or practice of receiving and entertaining strangers or guests without reward or with kind and generous liberality. So as we talk about being hospitable to others, it means to be willing to entertain, to be willing to take in and provide for people, even strangers, without an expectation of something in return. It's interesting to me that we talk about the only time we use the word hospitality is the hospitality industry because there is nothing about not getting something in return in the hospitality industry. Uh, it is obviously very focused on compensation, right? But when you use this as a personal word, it's talking about you being willing to take in somebody, let's say into your home, to provide for them. That might be a meal. It might be an opportunity for rest. It might be a respite from the storm outside. Fill in the blank. But it's this idea of me welcoming somebody in, entertaining strangers without the expectation of compensation back. It also brings with it the idea of being willing to do that with kindness and generosity, right? I might let you in my house, but man, close the door behind you when you come in and just stay right there. I'll pull you up a chair, you can sit down. That's the extent of my hospitality, sorry. No, it's this idea of kindness and generosity, being willing to give liberally to provide for the comfort, care, and rest of another. If you think about this word, the, the, the word here uh, that's translated into English as hospitality is actually only found two times in the entire New Testament. And part of why I think we're able to say that it's not just given to hospitality. The other one talked about distributing to the necessity of the saints. This says given to hospitality. 
And whenever I talk about giving to hospitality, I mean when I say entertaining strangers, this is not just brothers and sisters in Christ that we're supposed to be hospitable to. You say, well, okay, so Webster's talked about entertaining strangers. Why do you think that means we have to be willing? The word is used two times in the entire New Testament. The other time, which we'll, we'll go ahead and, and turn over to now, but we'll look at it again here in a minute. If you look at Hebrews chapter 13, Hebrews chapter 13, it says in verse 1, Let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. That phrase, entertain strangers, is one word. It's the same word that's translated hospitality in Romans chapter 12. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers. Those are the only two places that that word is found in the entire New Testament. Give into hospitality and be not forgetful to entertain strangers. Now the word hospitality is used in other places in the New Testament, but it is a different word behind the scenes, okay? Doesn't mean that they're separate, doesn't mean that they're in two different categories, but it is two different words. Let's talk about some of those words for just a minute. The one uh, dealing with that we're often used to, given to hospitality, which is like in 1 Timothy chapter 3. We'll turn over there real quick. 1 Timothy chapter 3. The word here um, that deals with hospitality, it is a different word, but it basically means fond of guests. That is hospitable. So again, that's why I'm saying, although it is a different word and has a slightly different meaning, I, I don't think that these are talking about two different things. They're talking about being hospitable, right? One of them literally means to be fond of guests. If you look in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, it says, This is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be <laughs> blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetousness, one that ruleth well his own house, having, the chil having his children in subje subjection with all gravity. We could keep going and reading. These, these are the qualifications of a pastor. These are the qualifications of a bishop. One of the ones that is a qualification is this idea of you need to be hospitable to people. You need to be welcoming without expectation of something in return. Smack right in the middle of things like the husband of one wife and not a brawler. Not greedy of filthy lucre. Stuck right in the middle of that is the idea that if you're going to be a good bishop, if you're going to be a good elder, you're going to be a good pastor, you better be ready to be hospitable to people. How can you be a good preacher, a good pastor? How can you be a good shepherd of, of one of the Lord's churches if in your own household you're not hospitable? If you're not a welcoming person, if you're not willing to welcome people without the return of something, how are you going to function as the pastor of the church when strangers walk in the door? Are we welcoming? Are we caring? Do we try to take care of them? Do we help to provide what they need? We often think about this word just being about being at home. Am I welcoming in my own home? Listen, I think the same concept applies right here in this building. When people walk through those doors to visit us, are we welcoming? Are we hospitable to them? Do we go above and beyond to try to make sure that we are taking care of their needs while they're here with us? Making them feel welcome? Not expecting something in return. Sometimes I think we do have ulterior motives. 
I hope they come back. I'm going to be as nice to them as I can be, so maybe they'll come back. I don't think that's quite what's meant. We just need to be willing to be hospitable to people without the expectation of something in return. So you can see here in Romans, I think it's telling us that we all as Christians need to be given to pursuing after hospitality. This passage here in 1 Timothy is telling us that as pastors, it's actually a qualification. You see the same thing in Titus chapter 1, verse 8. Titus chapter 1, verse 8. But a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate. Do you see the types of things that being hospitable is stuck in with? If you back up, blameless, steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre. It's at the end of that list that we say given or a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate. This has got a lot of stuff that this is right in the middle of, isn't it? There's a lot of things right here in this. We tend to shrug this one off, don't we? Listen, given to hospitality is no less important than not being self-willed or not soon angry. We tend to like to look at these lists and rank them. Well, I'll do this one and I won't do that one. I'm okay at this one. Yeah, that one I'm not going to put so much effort into. Given to hospitality. Hard one for some of us. Some of us it's okay. As we keep going, here's another thing about it that you need to know when it talks about being given to hospitality. If you turn over to the book of 1 Peter for me, 1 Peter chapter 4. Let's start in verse 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves. For charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as, God, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. You can take several things away from this passage. Again, one, remember the context. It is surrounded by things about being sober, watching unto prayer, fervent in charity, covering a multitude of sins with love. At the end of that, you say, use hospitality to one another without grudging. You say, well, what in the world is grudging? It basically means without complaining, without whining. Do it willingly. It reminds me of Brother Philip was talking here a while back about how that we can give gifts. And he, he used the example of what would it be like if he went out and got his wife an anniversary gift. And then he complained the entire time he gave it to her about how much it cost and what effort he had to do to get it done. It's kind of like that. Let's have somebody in our home. We're going to feed them. We're going to give them a place of rest. We're going to help take care of them. And at every step of the way, we're going to remind them of the effort that we're going through for their sakes. Man, you just don't know how much I gave up this week so that you could stay here. You don't know what I was going to buy with the money that I bought your food with. We got to do it willingly not grudgingly. Now, we laugh at my example because, I mean, seriously, which of us is going to have somebody in our home and then complain about them the whole time? We probably won't. What about up here? The things of God are often in the heart and the mind, right? They're often maybe not even visible to those around us. But as you take care of these people and you help these people, 
are you doing it grudgingly? Are you kind of like the Israelites, you know, when they were out of Egypt and God would give them something and they'd be happy for a little bit and the first time it got difficult, they were whining and complaining and whimpering about all the stuff they didn't have or what they were having to go through. That's what grudging is. It's that same concept right there. I think this very much reminds me of that passage that says, let love be without dissimulation. It needs to be sincere and genuine. Right? It's the same kind of concept. But verse 10 of, of 1 Peter chapter 4 says, As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. I think this is a great passage to remind us of why we need to be doing these things. God was gracious and merciful to you. You take those things God has given you, and you in turn be gracious and merciful and minister to others. The other thing that you learn from Hebrews, we read this a little bit ago. Turn over to the book of Hebrews. We'll turn back here. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13, verse 2. You never know who God may send your way. You never know what blessing that you may be able to be a part of, what work that the, the simple act of hospitality that you gave, what that might enable or what part of God's ministry that might support. This verse that talked about be not forgetful to entertain strangers, the last half says, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. God may have sent somebody to you to be taken care of, and who knows who you will have helped care for in the course of your time being entertaining of strangers. That idea of entertaining angels unawares, the idea of you may not even know what you just did completely and totally. You may not fully understand who it was that you just helped care for or maybe what the Lord is going to use that person for down the road. Sometimes God sends us people. It's maybe a little bit of a test for us. Are you going to return God's grace, God's mercy, God's compassion, God's kindness to others? This is easy for us sometimes when we talk about each other, right? I know you guys. We're related in many cases. It's easy for me to have you guys in my home. It's easy for me to be welcoming when you guys are here. What about we stick that word entertain strangers in there? How easy is that? And listen, I totally understand it as a father. Man, I got to be careful. My home, my job is to protect my family. And obviously, I don't want to put my family in danger. And so I'm not going to be careless in regards to some things that I do. But listen, I need to be willing to be help and encouragement, a place of rest, a place of renewing for people. It's neat when you look at, when you look at Christians you think about the different Baptist churches. I have traveled to a lot of different churches where they don't know me and I don't know them. What a great opportunity to show hospitality, right? I have been to places where I didn't know a single person there, but man, they take you in, they make you feel welcome, they feed you, they get, make sure you got all the needs that you have, they show you hospitality. And they aren't expecting anything back. I don't have to write them a check when I leave. It's a good example of how you can be hospitable. I do wonder sometimes I'm going to tie this in to some other stuff and we're not going to spend any time on it. I do think sometimes we have lost 
we have lost how much the Bible talks about the care we are supposed to give to those in need. The Bible actually talks a lot about giving to the poor and helping those that are without. Um, and I'm not going to spend any time on it here. Just think about that when you think about giving to hospitality because I think we as, as Americans, especially conservative Americans, we have very strict values and they're good values in regards to you know, the, the way things should function. In the course of that, I think we have sometimes lost how much the Bible does talk about caring for those in need. Think about that when you think about hospitality. The thing that I want to talk about as we come down here to the close, I say close. <laughs> We're getting close, people. We're getting close. I think we do want to be careful about the reasons for what we do and the attitude with which we do it and the fact that we need to be diligent in our efforts for hospitality. I want to give you one example, and this is, I, I'm careful here because I understand and I will cover both. The passage I'm about to read, hospitality is not the main point of this passage, okay? I think it is a good example of somebody who was putting on an outward appearance of hospitality but did not have true hospitality, okay? If you would, turn over to the book of Luke for me. Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. This is dealing with, as you think about it, this is dealing with uh, a Pharisee by the name of Simon. And he has invited Jesus into his house for a meal. In the course of this, there's what would be defined as a sinful woman that has come in and she has been weeping over Jesus, washing his feet with her tears and the hairs of her head and just showing this amazing respect and gratitude for who the Lord is. And keep that in mind as we go through this. Starting in verse, let's start in verse 36. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went unto the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in, in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, bought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him weeping, and began to wash his feet with her tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with ointment. Now when the Pharisee which bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. You get this idea of their sitting around having this meal, and this woman is crying and weeping, washing Jesus' feet, anointing Jesus' feet, and this Pharisee is sitting back here not saying anything, putting on the front of being a good host, but internally he's thinking, if he were really a prophet, He'd know who this woman is, and he wouldn't let her touch him. You get the impression that he already wasn't convinced Jesus was who he said he was. He said, if this man, if he really were a prophet, there's very much an attitude of looking down on Jesus Christ and Jesus not being what he claimed to be. But in a lot of ways, with the people, Jesus was, had performed some mighty miracles. And this man wanted to have this great teacher into his house. Putting on an outward sign of hospitality. In verse 40, And Jesus answereth, saying unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. Interesting to me. He calls him master, rabbi, leader, right after thinking, well, if this man was really a prophet, he would know this woman was 
a sinner. Do you see the, do you see the outward difference compared to the inward attitude? Verse 41, there was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me therefore which of them will love him the most. Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said unto the woman, Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. Now listen, I want you to understand, I am not saying that the main theme of this passage is hospitality, but I thought it was a really good practical example of somebody that wanted to put on an outward show of hospitality, but yet when his guest was there, he didn't have his feet washed, he didn't show him the respect that you would normally show somebody that had come into your house, but yet this one, this sinner, showed all of these things that Jesus Christ said, why didn't you wash my feet? Why didn't you anoint me with oil? Why didn't you do this? Inwardly, this man was showing respect for Christ, even calling him master. But man, inwardly, he was, well, he's not really what he says he is. He isn't really this. He isn't really that. And I think to some degree, what Simon really thought about Christ is actually reflected in the way that he treated him when he had him in. Because it was the practice of the day to offer to have your feet washed. And he says, Simon, man, this woman that you're thinking is a sinner, she hasn't ceased to cry over me and to wash my feet with tears. You didn't even give me water to wash my feet. Now the main point of this is not hospitality, but it is a good example of is your heart right in what you're doing? Is your attitude right? Are you really taking care of the people that you have into your home? Now, because I don't want to use this passage just to talk about hospitality, since that's not the main point, we will talk for just a second about what this passage really is dealing with. This is really dealing with the heart condition of these two people. Right? One of them thought they didn't need forgiveness. One of them thought they didn't need the Lord Jesus Christ. The other one knew what she was, knew what she needed, recognized who Christ was, and was showing great honor and respect for this one that could redeem her and wash away her sins. This story is very much about those two things. Simon who felt he didn't need much forgiveness, and the woman who really knew what level of forgiveness she needed. Truth be known, Simon needed as much forgiveness as this woman did. But Simon didn't see it. That's what this passage is about. But again, I wanted to use it because as you read, it is a good example in my mind of how sometimes uh, hospitality goes. We, uh, we do tend to... Uh, maybe not have the right heart and the right attitude about things. And sometimes you can even be doing some of the right things, but inwardly, your heart's not in it, right? What did it say back there in that other passage? I think it was in Peter, or Hebrew, hey, Peter. Use hospitality one to another, not grudgingly. You almost get the idea that this man here had Christ in his house almost because it was the thing to do but inside, he was complaining about the very guest that he was claiming to show honor to. We need to be generous hosts. We need to be welcoming people into our home. We need to be welcoming them into our church, making them feel welcome, making them feel like they are here. It is something, by the way, like I mentioned, that we are supposed to pursue it. 
follow after it, ensue it. Those are the terms that are often used in the Bible to de describe this idea of pursuing it. So as we close tonight, we can ask these questions. How are we doing with this as an individual? Are we hospitable to people? We can ask this question, how are we doing as a family? Is our family hospitable? How are we doing as a church when people come in? Are we hospitable? Are we doing it for the right reasons? Are we taking care of the people that are under our care, yet we're also doing it without grudging? Is our attitude and our actions toward them a good reflection of our Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ is our pattern. We want to pattern ourselves after him. He has shown us great grace and great mercy at a time when we were strangers, at a time when we were enemies. Can we do the same? That's the question. Given to hospitality. All right, Brother Philip, would you come and lead us in a song, please?